introduce to you this morning one who needs no introduction in our midst because Father Mike Berry is our spiritual advisor and has been for maybe at least 20 years. And so we are so grateful to God for Father Mike Berry. And we thank you for coming today, Father, to be with us. And Father's going to teach us on inner healing and the different aspects of that. And after he does that, then we'll break up into our small groups. Okay? So God bless you. As we hear, I'll let Father begin that prayer for that. Lord, we ask your blessing upon us. We pray for the word received, and not so much for the word delivered. We pray for a deep anointing, Lord Jesus, a deep anointing on what it is that's stirring within our hearts, especially during the next 20 or half an hour, or whatever the time uh, may be. But uh, something stirring deep within us. We give that to you, Lord Jesus. We pray especially that we be open to it. Bless us in your holy name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Okay. Um, last Monday... I went to the dentist, and I have a Korean dentist, okay, and she said, she started poking in here, and she said, I have good news and bad news for you, and I said, what is it? She said, the tooth broke off. She said, that's the good news. We don't have it. She said, but now we have to do an EXT. You know what that is? So I said, not today, honey. No, no, no. no. I have to go back on Monday. <laughs> so that's what we're going to do today. So she has another, I think, she doesn't have my name anymore. <laughs> she has root canal in front of me. That's it. So that's what we're going to do today, a root canal, a spiritual root canal. Um, um, any of you ever heard of the date, 8th of September, 1565? That's a birthday. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's the date on which the first mass was said in the United States of America. Wow. Mm -hmm. It was St. Augustine in Florida. I was there about two weeks ago. I was trying to advise them on if they should get Tebow back to Jacksonville. I don't know. <laughs> but I stood in that spot. And what a magnificent place. It's on a bay. There's no church there. There's no church there. But there is a church back in the town. Uh, but it looks out on the bay, it's a beautiful spot. And Menendez, uh, who landed there, uh, at, uh, and, uh, it was called uh, the Feast of St. Augustine, or San Agostino, is 28th of <coughs> August. And he landed there on the 8th of September and uh, said the Mass there. That was why it, but it was a magnificent spot. When you think of all the Masses that have followed in the United States and the survival of the church. So uh, again, uh, it was a, a good experience just to stand there and to think of all that went by. Um, Angie prayed that prayer um, for deliverance and all of that. You know, It's a very good prayer. It's a prayer you should say all the time. And she covered everything that can come against you from the outside. What about the inside? What about what's inside within you? We talk about inner healing. And the inner healing is for a wound within you. It's a lie, but most of us believe it. It's different for every one of us. It's almost tailor-made to each one of us. And, and uh, you know, the inner hurt, the inner pain. And we have great examples of it in the scriptures. We have, which I've shared with you many, many times, um, John 4 the woman at the well, who had difficulty in relationships, all sorts of difficult relationships, four of them that we know of. And finally, her healing came when she was able to see that and shrink it down from what it was, how much it had affected her, and she sort of, you know, uh, did kind of a root canal and took it, got it away from, she was able to see it. One of the strongest points you have, you know, is your faith. This is the year of faith. You belong to a, a, a community. I didn't say a group. You belong to a community such as this, you know, where you can empathize with one another in the spirit. Not just empathize and tell us where the sales are, but empathizing in the spirit. Okay? And that's a tremendous source for healing. 
So the woman at the well, Nicodemus in John 3, again, another inner healing. And inner healing takes time, it takes time. You belong to this community here. And what happens, the more you, know, you get involved in it, the more you start doing your lessons. And incidentally, this is a good lesson, I understand. You didn't do it today, you had me do it for you. So, <laughs> it is a very powerful lesson. It has a lot of affirmation in it. It has Psalm 139, you know, fearfully, wonderfully made. It has First Peter chapter 2, 10, I think, which speaks about a chosen race, a royal priesthood. You know, that's God's word. That's who we are. That's who we are. So it's a, it's a whole lot of affirmation that has to happen when we're dealing with inner hurts or inner pains. So if you look at one of the saddest uh, people in the scriptures, you know, and yet one of the most blessed was Leah. Remember Leah? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Leah was the first wife of uh, Jacob. And she was rejected. She was in a loveless marriage, you know. And uh, she wasn't the most handsome woman at all. And, uh, Yet, she's the mother of most of the tribes of Israel. Most of the tribes of Israel. And it was tough. She named her kids rejected, and she named all of them. You know, God has, God has looked upon me. Mm -hmm. Where uh, Jacob would not, you know. And yet, you look at Jacob, and he had an inner wound too. You know, it was called deception. You know, deception in his life. So the inner wound is particularly uh, ours. It's particularly ours, and we, it takes a while we can do all of the external stuff, and that helps. That helps. You know, don't get me wrong, I'm, I'm not dismissing it, but as a community such as this, that, that really is, is going to bring out the inner wound in each of us, and we have to confront it. We have to confront it, or it will confront us, and sometimes it takes a while. It takes a while before we're able to look at it. What is the inner wound? Basically, it's a lack of love. It can be rejection, okay? It can be put down, you know? It can be, but we manufacture it. The evil one helps us to manufacture it, you know? Uh, this uh, gal I spoke with just a few weeks ago, and uh, she's probably in her 30s, I don't know, in, in that age bracket, but she's, grew up, she was molested, you know, and after a while she figured, you know, this is what gets me attention, my own sexuality, and she wandered in and out of all sorts of relationships. She had an abortion, two abortions, I think. So the inner wound is things of that sort, and it's what you perceive, what you perceive. You know, I know one uh, gal, a little baby, she was never picked up because our folks were at work all the time. Both mother and father were at work. And that registered in her all her life. She was never any good. Never any good. It's a lie that's there. But we believe it. We believe it in, in, the, in the worst possible way. I told you the story years ago about Private Slovak, who was uh, executed, the only one soldier executed for desertion in World War II. And before they killed him, they said, you know why you're being killed, why you're being executed? Yes, he said, for the bread I stole when I was five years old. That's, you know, that's a very, that, that's permeated his whole life. You know, nothing good can happen to me. Nothing good can happen to me. If I get by, I'm okay. I'm okay. But <coughs> deep down, there's a contradiction. And the evil one will use that. The evil one will use that. That's an open door. The only one to close it is ourselves and the Lord. Okay? And then so many times people will try to, you know, figure out what it is. But, you know, you need to see it. You need to be able to identify it and own it. Okay, then once you own it, now what are you going to do about it? Okay, so identifying it, you know, many times. Um, I, I told you that story too about the gal who was in her 50s, well, 50s. And uh, we used to pray over her, nothing, nothing, nothing. And it was that her brother, you know, looked upon her uh, naked. And that was not, that was not the wound. The wound was her father committed suicide in front of her. 
and it has a lot to do with with parents, uh, with parents, or with what we perceive. Another gal, you know, um, her sister got all the attention, and she didn't get any. Okay, don't be like your sister. Your sister's giving us nothing but trouble, nothing but trouble. You know, so stuff like that that comes into your life, that comes into your life, and we we believe it, and it seems to repeat itself in our lives. It seems to repeat itself in different situations. You go to work and you know you don't get out of work. You know, things like that happen there. You meet rejection again. You go through a divorce and really it's not his fault. It's really my fault. It's really my fault. That's you know I'm just I'm just no I'm I'm no good. I'm no good. It's a lie, but why does it have such a like a root within us, it has a root within us. And it can be something, as Angie uh, intimated, it can be something that comes from the family. It comes from the family, you know, way back. And it can be something that is perceived, but you have to sit down and say, you know, and especially when you begin to a community like this, you're not going to go backwards, you're going to go forward, and sometimes you have to confront that, and it's very painful. It's very painful. It doesn't come out without tears. It doesn't come out without tears. And it may take a while. It may take a while for it to come out. Mm -hmm. I'm going to introduce to you now something that you may have heard before, but it's going to confuse you. It's going to confuse you. And you'll have a lot of questions. You'll have more questions than you will have answers. And that's an inner vow. An inner vow. People make inner vows. They make inner vows. What is an inner vow? Okay. Um, it's a vow that you look at your belly button and you make one. <laughs> <laughs> Just want to see if you're still awake. <laughs> example. Example of an inner vow. This girl was a, a child. She was the eldest of nine children. And when her mother got pregnant, everything came on her shoulders. And she handled it quite well, except for her brothers. Her brothers gave her a tough time. And she said, you know what? I'll never have a boy child. Never have a boy child. And she got married and had two, two children, two little girls, two miscarriages, two boys. That's an inner vow. Okay? We bind ourselves. We may not mean it at the time. We may mean it at the time. We, don't, we want it to be over and done with. Okay? An inner vow. This gal, you know, there, um, she was engaged to be married twice. And both of them broke off. And she went in and she was talking to this counselor. And uh, he said, well, what was your dad like? I never knew my dad. I never knew my dad. Well, I did. But I didn't. I did. Well, when I was just a little girl of four, you know, my dad left us. And my mom had three of us. And she struggled. She had to go to work. And, you know, things were not good at home. We couldn't, we barely survived, but my mom, my mom, my mom did all this, my mom did all this. And I, I never, I said, I never want to see my dad ever again. That's an inner vow. That's an inner vow. Why? Because she excluded, you know, men from her life. It was her father. It was not a good experience, definitely not a good experience, but it, it damaged, it damaged her. It damaged her to the effect that came into her adult life. Okay? And sometimes, you know, you hear another woman share with you, <coughs> and you say, that's ridiculous, you know. How could she believe that? But she does, because it's, it's got a root within her person, within her personality, you know, within her personality. We have situations that happen with molestation. Uh, you know, a woman who was molested as a girl of about nine or 10, and she disobeyed her mother, and it was her fault. Till the day she died, it was her fault. It was her fault. Because she disobeyed her mother, God was punishing her. And God said, come to me, all you, and ask, and you shall receive. She said, those are all lies. Those are all lies. Because I've been asking him, I've been asking him. And you can ask, and you can seek, but you've got to give, give God the power. Give God the power. Allow God to do it. Okay? Allow God to do it in that sense. And, Many people will make inner vows in, in so many different ways. 
Okay, men will make them, you know, um, situations like that. Um, I want to be like my dad, you know. Uh, dad is an uh, dad is an alcoholic, so you go up being an alcoholic, and it, it's uh, these are very formative years, but years, and that's carried on, carried on in life, carried on in life. I can trust. I will never trust a man. I will never trust a man, because I see, you know, my dad went out, my mom, or you know, vice versa. I will never trust. That's an inner vow. Okay. Now, inner vows have to be broken. Okay. How do you break? Remember the first words of Jesus in Mark's Gospel? We're reading Mark's Gospel now. What's the first words of Jesus in Mark's Gospel? Hmm? You have the first word. Repent and receive. Repent and receive the good news. One of the biggest obstacles to inner healing is unforgiveness. Unforgiveness that many times it may not be another person, it may be yourself. You know, I can't forgive myself for being imperfect. That's me. <laughs> but you know, it doesn't apply because I'm perfect anyway. <laughs> but people will do that. No, no, no. If I can just see Jesus and tell him, I'm going to do this to fix up that, okay? I'm going to do this. It's stupid? No, 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 it's not stupid. No, I really need to kind of, you know, and we get people in confession coming, confessing sins that happened many, many years ago. It's been forgiven. It's been forgiven. You know, why are you going back? You know, you're digging a hole. Confucius say, he who digs a hole loses much ground. <laughs> Again, unforgiveness is like the preliminary step. It's a preliminary step to go back and, and to be able to recognize the inner vow. It's all tied up with inner healing. It's all tied up with inner healing. The inner vow can be something, you know, I will never let anybody get into my heart again. Nobody's going to get into my heart. Emotionally, it's too much. It's, it's too much. Women who miscarry a child. I don't want to be pregnant anymore. It's too painful. It's too painful what I went through. I don't, you're, you're protecting yourself, but you're also sort of solidifying something in you that is destructive. And it grows as we, as we, get, as we get older. You know, things of that sort. Uh, and again, each one is very, very distinct. You know, it may not may not be a big thing to anybody else, but it is to that person. It is to that person. You know? So uh, having that sense, you know, of, you know, especially with a community, with, with the prayer and the praise, you're coming into something like that. And, and, and don't give up. Don't say, well, you know, I'll always be like this. That's another end of the you know, I'll always be like this. You know? um, so... We get it all the time. I do Rich's Vineyard uh, Retreat work, and we get people. I've done the worst possible thing. It's the worst possible thing. My mother was right. I'm just no good. I'm no good to any man. Mm -hmm. uh, stuff like that. We get it caught up with sexuality. We get it caught up with emotions. All of those things. You know? So, again, to forgive. Forgive yourself. You know what? Well, I'm okay. Everybody else may not think so, but Lord, I am. I'm okay. Check me out in the mirror. I'm okay. I'm doing fine. Mm -hmm. To be good to yourself. You know, read your, your scriptures for today. Very, very affirming scriptures. Mm -hmm. they, they have the, you have the example in there of, is it John 5, 1 to 9 or something? About the man at the pool of Bethesda. Okay. And he wasn't healed. And he was at the pool. I often tell well, why didn't he just stay at the edge of the pool and when the water just flop in right away? <laughs> and Jesus says, do you want to be healed? Do you want to be healed? That's another aspect. Sometimes people don't want to be healed. You know? I pray with people and they're praying for uh, like heart problems or disease or something like that. And there's something deeper, deeper down. Behind every physical thing, there's something some inner hurt, some inner hurt or pain. Okay. 
The inner heart are things we cannot measure, but they measure us. Like what? Abandonment, rejection, you know, feeling no good. I remember a, a gal who for years, you know, was a disappointment to her parents because they wanted a boy and they got a girl. Even into adulthood, even into adulthood, she was still behaving, you know, like a man. There was a, a thing, I don't know if this, I remember seeing a movie way, way back. You know, this back before uh, Kennedy was president. No, no, it's not that far back. <laughs> a little boy who decided not to grow. A little boy who decided not to grow up. <clears throat> I think the movie was Flower Drum Song, I'm not sure, but you know, he had decided because he saw what the parents were going through, the difficulties that his <clears throat> parents and adults were going through. I think it was an Italian family, and uh, he decided, no, I'm not growing up. And he was able to stunt his growth, you know, whatever way he was able to do it, but it was. Okay? Those are inner vows, the inner vows, and they're there, and the evil one uses them to block you on your way to being closer to the Lord. To be close to the Lord, and you have them in the Bible. You could even see, you know, someone like Peter, mm -hmm, who had inner vows. He wanted to be in charge, you know, all the time. And it finally came to him in John 21: "Depart from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man." It's the recognition of it, not so much in a condemnatory way, but in a way that you begin to accept it as, "This is part of me. This is not all of me." This is not all of me. And sometimes we think this is the only thing in our lives. The only thing in our life. Anxiety comes from it, you know. What if you really knew me, you wouldn't love me? That's true, but not for Jesus. Not for Jesus. People will hold something, they have something, they know about you, all of those things. Mm -hmm. It's not true, obviously, but... You know, we, we get it from people, but we don't get it from Jesus, you know. First reading on Sunday, Jeremiah. Before you were formed in the womb, I knew you. <clears throat> Where was I? <laughs> was I in cyberspace? You know, before you were formed, that's... Jesus' love for us is greater than our love for Jesus. And that's tough because... If they were equal, uh, yeah, that would be pretty good. That would be pretty good. But no, his is overpowering. Now, a way to discover the inner hurt or the inner pain, you know, to do prayer, you know, praying with people, other people, but praying with people that you trust. Not just anybody. Not just anybody. Praying with people that you trust. And then sometimes with feelings, when your feelings sort of hang in there. You may be at a Christmas party, a social or something like that, and everything is going well, and all of a sudden, you're going to tear up. Well, i got to go to the restroom. <laughs> so I'm, you're in there crying. Something has hit you. What you need to do is, after that, when you get time, describe the feelings in writing. Describe them in writing. Follow them. They will drop down to a level, a deeper, sort of a spiritual, uh, um, psychological level. Then you ask yourself, when did I feel this before? What you're doing is you're peeling an onion, and sometimes that onion is frozen. <coughs> because you've avoided it for years. And, you know, I went to college, I got married, I had my children, you know. No, they're God. Yeah, I'm just like a little girl again. Nobody hear from me now. So you're, you're touching down into some type of thing that happened, as Angie described it, in a traumatic experience perhaps, would be a, like an experience of nothingness. There's nobody there. I'm not there. I'm not there. So you, you get some idea of what it was at that time. You know, it may take you a while, but sometimes you, you can't write anymore. You can't write anymore. 
you get frozen. You get frozen with, with pain, with anxiety, with things of that sort. So, another way to do it, and what happens from, from this, like inner vows and things of that sort, we have a behavior. That's what I talk about, the internal. We have a behavior that's inside, and we have to, to break that. We have to break that, and that's what repent is, unforgiveness, repent. That's one of the, that's the first stage, repent. You know, uh, we can be angry, you know, uh, I, we, I repent of this vow that I made. I repent of, and I repent of all the behavior attached to it. Again, what behavior would be attached to it? it? It could be a sense of withdrawing, it could be anger, it could be judgment, you know, it could be unforgiveness. There's a beautiful story of, of forgiveness in the scriptures, and you know it. What is it? The prodigal son is right. Mm -hmm. The prodigal son. You have the, the image of God the Father, the loving God the Father, coming out to meet him. What would happen instead of the father if the brother came out? <laughs> Do you ever think of that? He would have gone right back to Vegas. <laughs> and that can happen. That can happen. We can, you know, be on our way to inner healing, and it can be a, like a big boulder, a rock, that comes into our lives. You know, you know what? I, I don't know where, where this came from. I, I don't want anything to do with that. That's, that, that's not you now. So we sort of back off. Too painful, too hard. Okay. So we repent. We renounce. We renounce any behavior, any uh, judgments, any way in which this has sort of ruled my life, controlled my life. I give the control to you, Lord Jesus. I give the control. I renounce things that I said that were hurtful. I renounce things that I, I took on myself. I renounce a crusade that I was on to try to prove that, you know, I was a very brilliant person. I renounce, and, and you, you get to know it. You get to know it. So it's the three R's. Okay, it's repent, renounce, and rebuke. Why rebuke? Because it'll come back at you. It'll come back at you in so many ways. The evil one is going to use it. He already has a hold of it. He already has a hold of it because many years you've lived like this. You know, and it's like the uh, the tooth that has to be pulled out. You know, so I rebuke that in Jesus' name. I rebuke that in Jesus' name. You know? and, and not to say dismiss it, not to say, well, I never made you know, a, an inner vow. You know? I mean, a vow has to be public. You know? Can you imagine if your marriage vows were private? Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh. It'd be a very different world, wouldn't it? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There would be no sacredness to them. They wouldn't be blessed. Okay? Nobody would know. Oh yeah, we, we were married. Mm -hmm. yeah. So a vow has to be public, it has to be witnessed by people. An inner vow, one of the famous inner vows made was by Martin Luther. He was under a tree in a lightning storm and uh, he promised God, if I get out of this, I will become a priest. That's an inner vow. It wasn't a calling from God, it was a calling from Martin himself. I have to do this. We make promises. Lord, if this shining light behind me is not for me, I promise, I promise. Mm -hmm. And you don't do it then, and two months later you get a worse ticket than that. No, no, but, you know, see what we're doing to ourselves? We're binding ourselves up. Okay? We're not allowing God to be God. You know? From the outside is the prayer that was said originally, but also from the inside, the fact that you <coughs> fearfully, wonderfully made, you know, according to Psalm 139, the saying quote in here, all of these are God's words to us. God's words to us. Remember, first chapter of Isaiah, first chapter of Jeremiah, you know, it's the call on their lives. There is a call, there's a deeper call in our lives than there was on the life of Jeremiah. 
Why? Because we have, we have been saved by the Lord. We've been re redeemed of the Lord. Uh, and sometimes it's a, a self-destructive element that comes in. You know, we have psychiatrists, we have all of those people we go to, you know, but rarely do they find that, that inner stuff that's inside. Okay. And it's in every one of us. So the, one of the ways once we discover it and to renounce even the, um, you know, the behavior attached to it. That gal who was molested decided, you know, this is what, this is what, this is what makes a difference. This is what makes me acceptable. You know, it's my body, you know, this will help me through life. And uh, she found out, well, all of that, it may have been, you know, a very fun life, she said, but it wasn't. It wasn't, she said. There was nobody in here. There was nobody in here, she said. And, uh, yeah, she says, I lapped it up, you know, drinking and all of that, she said, but it was no life. But the word said, yeah, that's the life. That's the life. We see it all the time, portrayed to the media and all of those things. You know, so again, the inner hurt, the, the things we cannot measure, things that are there almost like our skin, the skin on our body. Okay? And we have to begin to bring the power of the resurrection, bring the power, the year of faith. You know, Greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. But that he that's in me, deep down, has to rise, we have to give uh, the Holy Spirit that power to be able to look at it. And it's not, it's not a pretty sight. It's not a pretty sight. Why? Because we have sort of, you know, incorporated it into our, into our lives, into our very souls, you know, into our souls. And again, you know, God has a better plan for us. God is, you know, he doesn't want us to be wrapped up in negativity, in self-condemnation. Neither do I condemn you. You may not know this, but supposedly, I was reading recently, Mary Magdalene made a pact with the devil. You know, pact with the devil. And the Lord freed her from that. Has anyone done? No, there is no condemnation in Christ Jesus. Then why would we condemn ourselves? Because you, you don't understand, Father. You don't, you don't understand what I've gone through. And honestly, no, I don't understand. But you do. You do, and that's why... The, that's what the power of the Spirit is doing, you know. That's what the power of the Spirit, and especially when you're in a community of the Holy Spirit, you know, you, you think that this just started and lasted all these years, you know, for a nice place to learn songs. <laughs> no, it lasted because the Spirit of God, you know, has not only blessed it, but increased it, has brought you know, into a sense of freedom, of freedom. What's the first thing that happens once you join up? I don't know. What are we doing? Go back to school again? <coughs> All of these. Oh. The Lord has a purpose. And the purpose, you know, the scriptures, they're hammering at your heart. They're hammering at your heart. And, and again, you know, instead of condemning yourself, this is who I am. You know? What does it say in the Hebrews? I had not seen or you heard what God has in store for those who love. And in many cases, we're breaking down, you know, stuff that's inside. Stuff that's inside that's not good. Okay. There's a little insight you have. You probably can see it in your husband. <laughs> but not in yourself. <laughs> and he can see it in you, but not in himself. So I tell you, what we do now, when we're going to break into groups, just pray those three prayers. Repent, renounce, and review. <clears throat> and each one of I repent of anything that has, you know, hurt me inside. You don't have to share it, okay? Uh, if you want to share it, you can, but you probably won't have time for that, okay? But uh, I repent of, you know, stuff that, and it can be a, a negative voice. It can be a rejection of self. Can be a rejection of self. You know, people grow up in a family. You know, I, I need to get out. I'm 16. I have to get out. I don't want to live in this family anymore. You know, this family is no good. So, you re repent and repent. Even though things have been done to you, you've been molested, you've been touched, you've been shamed. I repent of that. But I had nothing to do with it. No, you didn't. But 
what has come on you is a sense of, of negativity. A sense of negativity. I'm, I'm denying my own sexuality. I'm, I'm not integrating it. It's your person. You know, it's your person. All of you, you know, are, are it's a whole, it's a part of you. Remember the reading last week, the second reading? No. Yeah. <laughs> you didn't go last week otherwise. You didn't do your lesson today, you didn't go to church last week. <laughs> second reading, the mystic, mystical body of Christ. You're a member of the body of Christ. Okay. And the head is working at you, okay, trying to bring you through, it, allowing you to perform as a normal member of the body of Christ. As a normal member. So you repent of that, and then you renounce any behavior, any behavior that has fallen down through the years. And then you rebuke anything that's coming against you. The rebuke has to go on, because it will come back at you over and over again. Okay. And is everybody on the same page? or? Yeah. Everybody awake? <laughs> Do you understand what the inner vow is? They're all lying to me. They're all so lying to me. <laughs> I can't hear you back then. No, no. No, no. The inner vow is never published. The inner vow, the inner vow is between you and your person. But the inner vow is, is sort of a defense, defense mechanism against uh, what Angie has described here, some traumatic experience. This gal, uh, she's a Hispanic, and uh, she was molested by her brother. Every night he would come into the bedroom touch her. Tremendous fear. She hated it. And she said, God, I wish he were dead. He was shot and killed. Now, look at the harmony she has. The molestation, and I killed my own brother. She didn't, but that's, that's what she's going through. That's what she's going through. Yes. Can an inner vow be a positive thing in the sense of um, growing up, I always um, experienced my mom very negatively, her negative attitude. Mm -hmm. Though I loved her and stuff and, and what have you. But I always grew up saying, I don't want to be like that. I don't want to, and I truly, I very clear vow of mom. But, That's an inner vow. But is that negative though? Is it, yeah. is it a bad thing? That's an inner vow. You're reacting. <laughs> I, I, I'm serious. I really am. It has seemed to work well for me. I don't know where it hasn't. I guess God would tell me that. But it, I will never marry anyone like my, my dad. You know. I will never... You know, all of those things are inner vows that they bind us. Kids. I hate you. I hate you. You need to rebuke that. <coughs> Kids are angry. They're angry little bodies and they're screaming and yelling. And so that hatred can, can last. I didn't mean it. It's only a kid. But it was said, see. So what you're saying, you know, what the Lord is doing in us, are you coming against that? There's another. Father, just see if I can. Uh, what's the difference between an inner vow and a promise? Inner vow is, is more, more power, more control. A promise, is, is, you know, a promise is weaker. A promise is weaker. Okay. So we have three repent, renounce, and rebuke. And before we dismiss, if I could just say one thing about an inner vow <laughs> is that an inner vow sets your will which is why even when you said, I don't want to be like my mother, the inner vow is setting your will against God's will, which is why you need to repent, okay? You're setting your will. I don't want God's way. I want my way, okay? 
And so the inner vow sets us against the will of God. So we need to repent and say, Lord, I want your will in my life. Maybe you want me to be like my mom in certain areas. Maybe you want to be, maybe I want to be like my mom uh, in regard to hospitality, but not in other ways. But you have to release that inner vow to Jesus. You repent of it. That's how you break the inner vow. And I think I've shared this before, but I'll share it again. An inner vow is like uh, being on a railroad track. When you're on a railroad track, the train only can go on a railroad track. So it's going to take you there. And if you try in your own humanity to get off that track, you've already made the inner vow. The inner vow is going to bring you right back because the train can't run any place else except on that track. And that sets you in a particular path, maybe a place where God does not want you to go. Okay, so an inner vow is setting you against the will of God, and so because we do want the will of God in our lives, that's why we need inner healing. Okay? Does that help, Father? Why didn't I think of that? No. <laughs> okay. well, that's a good distinction. You know, the will is it my will or God's will? Yeah. I think that's key for to answer you. Okay. The. Uh, Teaching today was kind of deep, and it takes a while. Uh, we just touched the um, surface. You know, it's, it's deeper than that. There's a lot uh, more that goes into that. So uh, some of you may have concerns, and just keep those three R's in mind. You know, uh, repentance, renouncing, and rebuking. Keep it in mind. And uh, again, this thing didn't happen overnight in you. It take a while. It will take a while for it, uh, for you to have a sense of, of God achieving something. You know, the only uh, bad news sometimes it gets worse before it gets better. So that's not. A, and then also it was a good uh, thing that Angie um, said there. You know, is it my will or God's will? And that that's a good clue to the inner vow. Is it my will or God's will? And sometimes as much as. We say things, you know, like you say, can it be positive? Uh, yeah, it can be positive, but am I taking control over it? Or is, am I leaving it to God? And that, that's one of the reasons many times why inner healing never happens, or when any type of healing never happens, is we still have the control. We still have the control. And when we think about, you know, the, the words in, in uh, Scripture, all of them, you know, uh, do you want to be healed? You know, and uh, you know, it was obvious to, to Jesus that maybe he didn't want to be healed. You know, uh, Bartimaeus. You know, what do you, Jesus said, "What do you want me to do for you, Lord, that I might see?" You know, the lepers. If you will to do so, you can make us clean. So it's always coming toward Jesus and letting Jesus be Lord, and not not having things. Another inner vow can be your sins. I can't be healed because I'm a sinner. I can't be healed because I'm a sinner. And think of it, all those people, you know, that were healed in the scriptures, they were all sinners. So you're eminently qualified. <laughs> so things of that sort, those are, and the whole inner structure of the soul, the inner structure of the soul, you know, in Augustine's words, you know, we, we're made for Christ, we're made for Christ, and Christ can't do any, anything more. He's already done it for us, and we need to be able to embrace it. Repent and believe the good news. You know, repent is coming up to Lent, Ash Wednesday. Key words, repent and, and, and receive the gospel. You know, and it's, it's that sense of allowing, as, a, as a, a scriptural community, allowing God's word to have impact upon us. His word is mighty if it will if we will allow it to impact upon us. You know, I think of, you know, what Saul had. Some type of an inner vow. You know, who are you? I'm the one you're persecuting. I'm Jesus of Nazareth. I never realized it. So there's a combination of all of that. As soon as he asked him his name, he was, you know, giving over to him. So, uh, especially, uh, and to realize, you know, Things that will come to you now that you have some idea of it, and don't be don't be afraid of them. Don't feel well. No, no, no. This happened to me. I am, you know, 
you have power over it. You have power over it because of the Lord in your heart. The Lord in your heart. And, and things that, you know, um, you may look back on all the time instead of looking forward. The Lord is leading you forward. And no matter what you've done, the main thing is you have survived. You've gotten here. And you're not here by mistake, okay? You're here because, you know, God had you here. God has, and he has you here. So, again, to realize it, and, you know, sometimes some of the language used may, may confuse you, you know. Uh, there, there may be a, a bond. You know, this past year, SCRC was very taken up by this, the Southern uh, California Renewal Communities, with the whole sense of exorcism, possession. Possession. You're, you're possessed only when you're driving the freeway. That's the only way. <laughs> Other than that, you're not possessed. But there's a big difference between being possessed and deliverance. There's a big difference between possessed and deliverance. To be delivered means there's some part of you that is not really with the Lord. And it can be anger. It can be, you know any of the seven deadly sins, okay? It can be a sense of, you know, of depression, totally overcome by depression. You know, a gal who used to work from home on Friday afternoon, get into her pajamas, wouldn't get out of them till Monday morning when she had to go back. There was no life other than the job, you know, things of that sort. Uh, so deliverance from that is a type of, uh, you know, it, it, it's much bigger, you know, External healing is easy because we look at you know the cancer, the heart problems, the kidney problems, whatever it is that has to be healed. We can identify that with the stuff that's inside. We may misidentify it. You know, we may think it's this, and it could be something far deeper. You know, so uh, to be patient with yourself and be good to yourself. Be good to yourself. Don't get into a sense well. You know, I, I'm going to do this inner healing today. You know. Um, but I, I'll, t I'll take a shower first and get all this stuff off of me. And, no, no, take, take your time with it. Be patient. God is patient with you so far, you know. Yeah. So you be patient with yourself. I have a little story for you before I finish. A story is told about somebody in Dublin. You know, there you are, Dublin. And in Dublin, they're, they're very grand in Dublin. Very grand. Okay. And they have this uh, street, they have the Odd numbers on one side, the houses even on the other side. And this gal was listening to the forecast and they said, uh, tonight we'll have um, six inches of snow in Dublin and we want you to park on the odd side of the road so that we can plow the even side of the road. And about two days later they said, tonight we're going to have nine inches of snow and tonight we want you to park on the even side so that we can plow the other side. And about a week later, I so said, we're going to have 12 inches of snow, and we want you to park in, and the radio thing cut out. <laughs> and she said, oh, what am I going to do? Oh, what am I going to do? And her husband said, why don't you leave the car in the garage? Let's go. <laughs> We'll stir in our heart, Father, for, for some time, and, and we'll just grow and we'll keep growing in holiness. Amen. And so, Father, we thank you for this meeting, and we say together, glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen.